All right, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Um, if everybody could mute uh, that's not speaking, that would be great. Um, thanks. Hello, and thanks for attending our club luncheon. Uh, the goal of the club is to bring together all Democrats from the most conservative to the most progressive to celebrate our shared values, appreciate who we are, and to work together to put more Democrats in office. Um, at this point, I'd like to mention our club luncheon sponsor, Albrecht and Albrecht Law Firm has been supporting this luncheon for several years now. So if you need legal help, please think about Albrecht and Albrecht. Um, <clears throat> some of you may be aware we originally had an LPEA candidate forum scheduled here but there were no challengers to any of the LPA incumbents on the board. And so the election was canceled and we didn't see that there was much point in trying to have a forum at that point. So we put together something else and our program today will feature a discussion of events in Ukraine from both a political and military perspective. So just a little bit of procedure. Everyone is asked to stay muted except for the speakers, myself and Kathy Devine and Karen Pontius who will be handling questions. And if you want to submit a question during the luncheon, please use the chat feature in Zoom. If you haven't done that before, just hover over your screen and you'll see a chat button at the bottom. And there will be a message box at the bottom where you can type something in. Make sure that little drop down says everyone so that your, your question goes to everyone. Um, if you're having trouble with your internet connectivity, you may want to disable your video. Audio only works better on slower connections. Uh, the Zoom meeting is being recorded and it will be available within a day or so for viewing. Um, you can also choose speaker mode, which is typically in the upper right corner, and that'll bring up a larger video of the person who's speaking. And finally, I'd like to encourage everyone to donate to the Plata County Dems in this election year. And monthly donations are particularly appreciated and you can set those up on Act Blue. Uh, monthly do donations also make it easy for you to give to the party with relatively, pain, relatively little pain. This is our third club luncheon for 2022. The club luncheon committee is working hard to bring some great programs for this year. Uh, we do not have details about our May luncheon yet, but we'll get that out uh, here shortly, I think. And if anyone has any other announcements to make, please enter something in the chat window and we'll recognize you at the end of the luncheon. Uh, we will begin our discussion of Ukraine with a presentation by Herb Bowman. Herb is the chair of the La Plata County Democrats. He's going to talk about the politics and history of the region. So, Herb, please introduce yourself and begin your presentation. Well, I'm Herb Bowman. I'm the chair of the La Plata County Democrats. Uh, hopefully, in the next few minutes, it will be clear why I'm speaking today. What I'd like to do, I created kind of a, a PowerPoint presentation to accompany my comments. Um, she has a lot of pictures better than me talking. If I can share the screen. And we can see your screen, Herb. Okay. Um, so let me start my presentation. Let me try to, to minimize all the pictures to the side here of all of you. Oh, that's okay, I can live with it. Um, what you're seeing here is a photograph that was in the Durango Herald in, on February 24th of this year, which shows a very large protest on Roostevelli Avenue in Tbilisi, Georgia. This is a protest against the invasion of the Ukraine by Russia. If you look at videos of the protests, you'll see that people in the streets uh, are backed up for blocks and blocks and blocks. There are thousands and thousands of people that are protesting the invasion. If you're also reading the papers, however, um, you would be reading that the Georgian government uh, is refusing to condemn the invasion, refusing to cut off democratic relations or, or excuse me, diplomatic relations and trade. Um, uh, which is inconsistent with the support you see in the street. You might also be reading that since the time of the evasion, thousands of Russians have left Putin's Russia and have come in to Georgia, a lot of them in Tbilisi, to try to escape Putin. And they are being treated warmly in some cases, but in many cases, they're being treated very coldly by the population. So What's going on here? What explains this inconsistency between government, the government's action and the public reaction? 
what exactly is Georgia's relationship to Russia? And most important to this talk, does the Georgian situation give us any insight into what has been happening between Russia and the Ukraine? Um, I am not a Ukraine expert, I'm not a Russian expert, but I did spend 2010 to 2015 living and working in Georgia directing a legal reform and human rights projects supported by the US government. I've also lived and worked in other post-communist countries, Poland, Albania, and Mongolia to name some of them. So I have some experience in the post-Soviet world. And what I'd like to do is take a shot at answering some of the questions I posed um, by way of giving at least some of my explanation for Georgia's, the Georgian government's ambivalent reaction to the Russian invasion. And I'd like to use a sort of a structural device, uh, these explanations, um, including nostalgia, fear, economics, cultural affinity, and mysterious unknowns. I think some of these um, elements are relevant to the Ukrainian situation as well. My, I have a, a slideshow called The Ties That Bind, uh, and it really starts first with um, trying to place Georgia on the map. Uh, many people may not be clear where Georgia sits. This is a map of Europe. Um, Georgia sits down below on this map where the red arrow is, it shares a long mountain border with Russia. It is very close to the Ukraine on the Black Sea. It shares a border with Turkey, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. The um, Georgian people, it's, it's important to understand, are ethnically unique and linguistic, linguistically unique from their neighbors. They have um, lived for thousands of years, they've uh, had a series of invasions. I should first say they've been a, they're a series of, have been a series of kingdoms um, that ran themselves at times, and over the years were conquered by the Persians, by the Arabs, and by the Turks. So they live in a very dangerous neighborhood. The relationship with Russia begins in 1783. I'll explain this photograph in a second, but. In 1783, one of George's kingdoms asked Catherine the Great for protection from another Persian invasion. She agreed and Georgia became a Russian protectorate and Russia essentially stayed for the next 200 years. Now this, this mural here sits in the, on the, in the Caucasus. I believe it was created by Russians um, it is a commemoration of this agreement between Russia and Georgia at the time. And it sits in a really interesting place. This is the outside of that mural. And I can see off to the right, because I've been there many times, there's a highway. And they call it the Russian military highway. They've called it the Russian military highway for 200 years, because it's the way the Russian military and uh, Russians in general have come down through the Caucasus in their invasions of, of Georgia and other areas, um, and you know, for other for obvious other reasons, no Georgian I know is particularly fond of this uh, memorial here. Um, but it's placed in a, in a very interesting point on the highway because it's a place where Russians coming through the country can see this memorialization and feel good about uh, their relationship with Georgia. Now, the takeover of, of Georgia by Russia was part of a large um, Russian expansion that took place over a few hundred years. Um, you can see originally from the map that Russia, back in 1533, I now can't see uh, the numbers, but let's see. Back in 1533, Russia occupied this piece of land. By 1689, it had moved very far east. By 1801, it had taken over pieces of Georgia and of course, pieces of the Ukraine. 
By 1825, it had taken all over all of Georgia, and in fact, had expanded uh, much greater and following much longer in for the following years. One thing that's important to understand is Russia's love for Georgia. They have a great affinity for Georgia's natural beauty. This is a village in, high in Spinetti. They have a great appreciation for Georgian people, great love of the Georgian people for the culture of the Georgians. They're very um, fun loving. Um, they were considered during the Soviet period to be the Italians of the Soviet Union. They like to dance, they like to sing, they have great food. And down through the years, famous Russian authors have written um, poetry and stories that romanticize the Caucasus and romanticize the Georgian culture. And I've heard it said by Russians and read it many places that Russians feel that Georgia and the Caucasus are a part of their soul. Um, and in a way, uh, I think some, if they were honest, might say Russians that they feel that uh, Georgia belongs to Russia. So the Tsarist period ended, ended when the Soviet Union came into existence after the revolution. And Georgia had a very, for a couple of years, it had its own independent government type of democracy, but it was quickly crushed by the Red Army. And Georgia became a republic, just like the Ukraine within the Soviet Union. Looking at this map, um, you know, I'm just amazed at how big an area it was. And if you look at the map, the red and the pink, it doesn't even show the Soviet vassal states over to the West, Poland and Hungary, and, and you might say Yugoslavia, Albania, or even to the east, Mongolia, which was not a part of the Soviet Union, but was a vassal state and takes up the size of Texas. So it was this huge empire and really uh, quite an achievement. Um, Georgia had a special status within the Soviet Union, in part because it was a favorite vacation spot for Soviets all over the empire, um, but also because of these two men. Many of you probably know that, that Joseph Stalin was Georgian. He was born in a town just outside Tbilisi. Um, he went to seminary for a time inside Tbilisi before he joined the Marxist movement. This man sitting here is Laurentia Berea, who was the most infamous KGB chief during the Soviet period. Um, he was also Georgian. He's holding um, Stalin's daughter, which is very creepy considering that he was um, a sexual predator for teenage, teenage girls. But anyway, um, one thing that us Americans didn't understand about the Soviet Union was despite it being behind the, ground, the Iron Curtain and the lack of freedom, there's a great deal of nostalgia among the older people, at least there was in Georgia, towards that Soviet period. I had um, a couple of uh, older men who drove for the program, drove the, the cars for my program um, in Georgia. One of them had been a um, factory manager during the Soviet period. And he would often say, um, the Soviet Union had problems but at least you didn't have to worry about tomorrow. You never had to worry about tomorrow. He frequently said that. And that, that was because in the Soviet period, everyone had a job, they were guaranteed a job. They were guaranteed healthcare. The women and, and minority groups during that period in some of the Soviet republics were better off than they'd been uh, previously. Not great, but better off. Um, you could travel extensively in the Soviet Union, which I didn't know uh, during those years. And you could travel cheaply. So you could, you could for almost nothing, get on a plane to Moscow from Georgia or any other part of the Soviet Union um, and have a great vacation. There was also a sense of uh, shared misery. Everyone was basically equally poor. And there was also um, pride in being part of uh, something bigger than yourself. Now, when it comes to Georgia, I think this nostalgia has faded a great deal through the aging population and also some of the events that have happened in recent years. 
that I have read that the nostalgia is very strong in Russia among the older generation and uh, among some uh, elements of the Ukraine. But the Soviet Union fell and in 1991, Georgians declared their independence from the Soviet Union and their lack of desire to join the Russian Federation. This um, party in the street also took place on Roostabelli Avenue. I can tell from the lights, everything happens on Roostabelli Avenue. But despite all this happiness, the 1990s were a very, very dark time for the Georgians. Georgia had uh, three, has three um, semi-autonomous regions, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and Ajaria at the time. Um, all of these regions at the fall of the wall wanted their own independence, not just from Russia, but from Georgia. There was a separatist movement in Abkhazia that began to um, you know, violently uh, try to throw off uh, any attempts for Georgia to control it and began to um, try to push out the thousands and hundreds of thousands of ethnic Georgians to live there. The Georgian government um, went in with troops. There was bitter, horrible fighting. Um, the Russians didn't take sides at first. They provided arms to both sides. But by the end of the conflict, the Russians were fully supporting the Abkhazians who drove the Russian forces, excuse me, the Georgian forces out along with about 250,000 ethnic Georgian refugees, which became internally displaced persons with, inside Georgia. The Russians established a um, protectorate over Abkhazia essentially, and it's out over South Ossetia. Um, and Georgia was you know, much poorer for the effort. During that time period, there was also a civil war between uh, rival factions within Georgia. The organized crime was very powerful and the corruption was ran rampant. Um, it was said that Georgia was the most corrupt former Soviet Republic of all at the time. Then came the 2003 color revolution, the Rose Revolution in Georgia. For this man, um, Mikhail Saakashvili, um, who had been the, uh, the uh, essentially attorney general, ministry, minister of justice uh, for the government at that time, he led a, a political movement uh, to push out Edward Shepard Nadza, who was the head of the government at the time, who was a former foreign minister for, during the Soviet era. Um, and he was successful in this. His movement was very pro-West, very pro-free market and very anti-Putin. At times he would taunt Putin and reminds me in some ways of uh, Mr. President Zelensky of the Ukraine, both in his youth and some of the things he says about Putin. But Saakashvili transformed the country. He did something incredible. Basically overnight, he ended a low level corruption in the country. He fired the entire police force. He replaced almost everyone over 30 in government and replaced them with very smart, very energetic, very confident 20 somethings. And he turned to the West. This is, this is again a picture of Roostabelli Avenue after he was elected. He turned to the West and uh, most especially the United States. This was a bronze statue that was put up during that period, very close to Roostabelli Avenue where you saw the, the initial uh, was protest in the first picture, obviously a statue of Ronald Reagan. In 2005, George Bush came uh, to visit Saakashvili in Tbilisi um, and to give the US um, Saakashvili's, uh, Saakashvili support. Of course, Putin was unhappy with this, um, but the support from the West really kind of emboldened Mr. Saakashvili and he made a, a very drastic mistake which has ramifications and echoes uh, into the present Ukraine conflict. Um, he had been successful taking back this little piece that had been a jar, had been semi-autonomous from the warlord that ruled it. And then he had his eyes set on South Ossetia. Um, he had rebuilt the military. 
And he made clear that the, one of his goals was to try to bring South Ossetia back, back into the fold. And in this, Putin baited him um, from all that you can read about it. Um, there's some, there, there's controversies, there's unknowns, but it's pretty clear that Putin and his government baited Saakashvili by using troops and militia from South Ossetia to make incursions into Georgian, Georgian ter territory to commit acts of violence, to harass Georgian ethnic population that lived in South Ossetia and to mass troops on the border and to have exercises on the border giving the impression that there was gonna be a Russian invasion soon to take over Georgia. So Saakashvili in 2008, August of 2008, against the uh, advice of the US government, um, decided to invade militarily and take South Ossetia back. So in August, he sent troops in and the first day or two went well, um, but after that, it went horribly. Russia was essentially waiting for this to happen and they had troops up on the border of South Ossetia. They had some troops in South Ossetia. They had a military base in Abkhazia and they had warships in a, in a few days off the coast. There's some similarities here with Ukraine, obviously. And these, the warships and the Abkhazian military forces uh, shelled and attacked military bases that were not near South Ossetia. And the Russian army sent a massive amount of troops down from the Caucasus through this long tunnel that separates the two countries. And this is a picture of the Russian troops coming down through South Ossetia uh, to get to the, to the valley to drive out Saakashvili's troops. This is a picture that sort of sums up the end result of that battle with the Georgians equipment destroyed and trying to get around or escape in, in, in ordinary cars. Now, Russia did not uh, take over the country, which everyone thought would happen. It stopped at the border, but pushed it out a little bit further. Um, but this was a disastrous defeat for Saakashvili. It took only five days. It wrecked his military. Um, it ended the foreign investment that was coming into the country for the time being, because who's gonna invest in a country that Russia can invade at any, any second? Um, and it also began to lose even, it also created a situation where Russians and the South Ossetians began to push the border out every year. They call it salamization, where every year they push this fence further and further into Georgian territory. So it was a huge loss for Saakashvili and it was a huge success for Putin. With relatively little effort, he was able to exert his dominance, not only over um, South Ossetia, but Abkhazia, and to make the Georgians understand that he could come in almost any time. So another reason, obvious reason for Georgian government ambivalence is fear. They know that any, any, any minute, any day, it's very possible the Russians could come through and take over their country. They literally sit in the middle of it. Another reason for the ambivalence, economics. Um, the Georgian economy does defend, depend to a certain degree on trade with Russia. They export about 12% of their goods to Russia, about 9% import, and there's a whole lot of Russian tourism. I don't know what the numbers are, but if you go to Georgia, you'll see that Russians are everywhere spending money, especially in the casinos. What I found interesting when I was looking at, for data here though, is that things have changed since I was there, even in five years. This uh, trade percentage is it's much less than when I was there. The, Rush, the, the Georgians have hydropower uh, and switched to that rather than uh, Russian um, energy. Uh, and they, they have a free trade agreement with China. The Chinese are building a gigantic road right through the middle of the country. So they're not as dependent on the Russians, but nevertheless, if the government were to cut off trade, it would be a substantial blow to the country, which is already uh, quite poor. How am I doing on time? Okay. Um, another reason for the ambivalence um, is culture. 
Georgia, about 85% of the population considered themselves Georgian, uh, Russian, Georgian Orthodox. Only about 15 to 20% people, people actually go to church, but their identity is wrapped up in the Georgian Orthodox Church, um, in part because it's the church that's protected the culture for centuries uh, during these, these invasions, including the Soviet period. The Georgian Orthodox Church is very conservative. It's very somewhat, it's regressive for sure. It's anti-gay and anti-women's rights to a degree. Um, when I say anti-gay, um, anti-LGBTQ, they view this as a, a Western decadence that's being pushed on them by Western powers. Um, this is, a, as an example, this is a picture of a riot that took place when I was there, again, on Roostabelli Avenue, um, where a group of parents of some LGBTQ um, kids had met for a rally in a small park. When the rally was over and they were trying to take this band to, to leave, a huge group, hundreds, maybe thousands of young men, led by Georgian Orthodox priests, attacked their van to try to get at them and hurt them. I think this is one of the priests here. Um, this is, happens fairly frequently. And I've read re recently that there was a similar incident where a couple of people were killed. The Georgian Orthodox Church is, um, is allied with the Russian Orthodox Church and you know, is, is a powerful, obviously a powerful force in Georgia. So if you're a politician or if you're a government, you really have to give a fair amount of deference to the Georgian Orthodox Church in your decision making, or you're not going to be in power very long. And finally, the mysterious unknown um, that I think is a, is a feature of a post Soviet world. This is a Boris Ivanishvili sitting in his home. He is an oligarch. He's Georgian. He was born in Georgia, but he went to Russia and he made a fantastic fortune um, after the fall of the wall and he supports the ruling party in Georgia. He was its prime minister originally and beat Saakashvili in the election back in 2012. Um, let me show you a picture of his house there. This is a picture of his house. That's where he's sitting. That's one of his houses and it sits right above Roostevelli Avenue. Um, massively wealthy. Uh, I've met him at, a, at an embassy party. He's a very short guy. Uh, didn't speak very good English, nice enough. Um, but when I say mysterious unknown, no one actually knows uh, how closely tied he is to Russia. No one actually knows how much of Russia's desires are being funneled through him, if any at all. But um, the population is never really sure. And there's always a concern that the strings are being pulled by either Ivanishvili or someone like him or Russia. So, those are five possible explanations for the Georgian government ambivalence um, toward the Russian invasion. I think um, some of those explanations for ambivalence or behavior on the part of uh, other parts of post-Soviet world exist as well. Um, I'd like to conclude though uh, with an explanation um, for the Georgian people's ambivalence toward Russians entering and remaining in their country during the present times. And I like to do it in, in using Georgian words. And I'll explain this before I read it. I have an American friend who moved back to Georgia to work in the program I would left. And he, this is just in the last few days, he's been telling me that when he goes into the stores, he's been observing how Russians are being uh, badly treated. For example, he was in a, a bank line uh, trying to open up an account, and he had no problem at all, but the Russians that were in front of him were rudely rejected. He was in a, in a cafe, and he told me that the, the Georgians were, you know, harassing and kind of driving some of the Russians out of the cafe because they were angry. And so what he did is he, he put up a Facebook post uh, giving his experiences, uh, and he was hoping that Georgians would write in and explain, you know, you know, why they were doing this or um, react negatively toward the mistreatment of Russians. And this is what someone wrote to him. I think I know who the person was, but I think it maybe is a, a great way to explain um, 
what the Georgians are feeling right now. It is true that there are all these discussions about how to treat an expected inflow of Russian citizens. I personally have been feeling very uneasy about some of these statements made. There is certainly no excuse for any kind of ethnophobia, but I thought I would briefly explain what is behind the increasingly hostile environment described in this message. That was my friend's message. Fear. Georgians are afraid that incoming Russian citizens will be quickly followed by armed forces protecting them. We've seen this in Georgia and many other countries. Fear plus shame. This is a different kind of fear. It's mixed with shame because of our government's ambivalent position with respect to Ukraine. As you know, Dreamers, the ruling party, decided not to join the sanctions. In this situation, Georgia may be used by Russia, Russian citizens, for avoiding sanctions. We feel truly ashamed and worried because it puts us on the side of the aggressor. Trauma. The events that are unfolding cause the sensation of a painful deja vu. All of us remember 2008 and some of us remember 1993, that's Abkhazia. Relatives killed, houses left, not being able to go back to your ancestors' homes. Having said all the above, I must say that we should definitely accept Russian citizens who are seeking asylum from Putin's regime. But these citizens should also try to understand that Russia is perceived here as an arch enemy. It has been so for a reason for the last 200 years. So that's my, that's my presentation. I hope it gave you uh, some insights about the post-Soviet world that uh, I think some of which are relevant to the Ukrainian situation. All right, thank you, Herb. I, I, I think some of the parallels are pretty clear. <clears throat> um, so we, we very much appreciate the fact that you've been there and you know, you know what happened in Georgia and, and how it ties into what's going on now. So we're gonna continue our discussion of Ukraine with a presentation by Terry Swan and myself about military topics especially those that I don't think have been handled very well by the mainstream media. So Terry, uh, take just a minute here and go ahead and introduce yourself. Okay, thank you. Um, I, my, I am not an expert in either Russia or Ukraine. My <laughs> expertise of any value um, would be in NATO. Uh, I had three assignments, 26 years in the Air Force and three assignments in NATO. As a major, I was the uh, Chief of the Air Defense Operations Center for 5th Allied Tactical Air Forces, which is a NATO Air Force headquartered in Izmir, Turkey. <clears throat> then as a Lieutenant Colonel, I was Chief of Operational Planning for the AWACS, NATO AWACS airplane, the Command and Control airplane. And that was at Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe. Interesting enough, the uh, SAC Europe, Supreme Allied Command Europe at the time was General Shashkavili. Uh, I think the same name as the uh, former president of Georgia. He was Georgian, spoke five different Eastern European languages. Then as a uh, colonel, I was the uh, deputy chief of staff for requirements for all NATO air systems, which meant we established requirements for new systems, worked with the acquisition agency to buy them, and then did in operational testing before we put them online. That was all under my authority. I also flew a uh, combat in the uh, Desert Storm in a NATO airplane and was the um, on senior air battle commander in the north in Turkey when we um, participated in Desert Storm, uh, which lasted about two weeks. I'm a graduate of the NATO school and the uh, NATO Defense College, which is in Rome, Italy, uh, and served in a Brigadier General position, my last assignment in NATO at SHAPE headquarters. So that's my background. Thanks, Terry. Terry and I are gonna split this next presentation. <clears throat> um, and just to give you a little bit of my background, obviously my name is Gwen Unger. I served 28 years in the US Army Reserve as an armor officer. And armor branch is the branch of the US Army which deploys tanks. And I retired with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. I will say that neither Terry nor I has any particular detailed <clears throat> information about the military situation in Ukraine. So we're going to keep this at a fairly high level and just kind of talk about some of the things, which, as I've mentioned, I don't think that this, the mainstream media, mostly I watch CNN, I don't think they do a good job of covering a lot of this stuff. So 
we'll see uh, what we come up with here. I'm going to share my screen, so give me just a second here. So I'm hoping that you're seeing my screen. If you're not, somebody interrupt me. Um, <clears throat> this again is, is a take on the military matters that are going on right now in Ukraine. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, we wanted to show this map and kind of show you where Ukraine is and where some of these cities that you've been hearing about are. So up here on the <clears throat> upper right corner is Russia. Uh, as you go around, there's Belarus. Then you get into some of the NATO countries, Poland, <clears throat> and down through Hungary. Um, and here, just a little bit so I can see. This is the Crimean Peninsula down here at the back, which was annexed by Russia in 2014. Um, you can see Odessa here. There's, it seems like there's more activity uh, from the Russians uh, bombing Odessa right now. Mariupol, which we've, we've seen horrible pictures of, is over here. This whole Donetsk region is kind of the area that... Uh, there are a lot of Russian separatists in, um, and that's where the Russians are saying that they're going to put their efforts going forward. And Kiev is up here, uh, a bit south of, of Chernobyl, and Lviv is over here in the westernmost part of Ukraine. So again, just you know, to give you an idea of what the situation looks like. Um, one of the things that much about is the at attack versus defense, and Everything else being equal, the defender has the advantage. I mean, there's absolutely no question about that. Um, and I'll talk about why. Typically, the defender has dug in positions. So they've prepared defensive positions. Um, the attacker then has to typically cross open territory. So you dig your defensive positions in to where the attacker would, in fact, have to cross open territory, which makes them a much better target. Uh, the defender also often has positions in depth. So if the attacker is about to take over a defensive position, the defense can move back to their next prepared position behind that. And then, of course, the attacker has to cross that open territory again. Um, <clears throat> obviously, the defenders, in this case, Ukraine, they know the terrain. They know it much better. I mean, you can, you can get maps and satellite pictures and all that kind of stuff, but there's nothing like actually knowing the terrain, uh, particularly when you're in defense. Um, most of the time, people will tell you that you need a three to one advantage at the point of attack for the offense to be successful, for the attack to be successful. So again, the defense at, at that point has an advantage in terms of people where the attacker has to, has to really pull forces together at the point where they want to attack. Um, <clears throat> you've probably heard a lot about tanks uh, in this particular invasion. Uh, the tanks, of course, are the heaviest armored vehicles. A um, <clears throat> couple of things. Uh, tanks do not do well in muddy terrain. They can be very vulnerable. I can tell you from a training exercise experience that tanks do not do well in muddy terrain. <clears throat> um, they tend to get stuck. Um, <clears throat> tanks are also not well suited to urban operations. If you, We're going to talk about some anti-tank weapons here in a little bit, but you think about a city, how many... Uh, positions that offers for the other side to hide and then pop up with an anti-tank weapon and then disappear. So typically you really don't want uh, tanks being stuck in an urban situation. Uh, tanks also use a lot of fuel. Most tanks get something like one mile per gallon of fuel. Um, so if you have tanks that are moving along, you have to be able to supply them with a tremendous amount of fuel as things start to move. And tanks are also vulnerable to anti-tank weapons. And we'll talk about the Javelin and the Enlaw. Those are weapons that can be used by infantry troops, single person, uh, to attack and defeat a tank. And one other thing that they really don't talk about is tanks are most effective when they're used with infantry. So in the US Army, we don't send out a tank battalion or an infantry battalion anymore. Uh, we typically make a task force. So a task force will combine some tank companies with some infantry companies, and the reason behind that is part of the infantry's job is to protect the tanks from other infantry. And part of the tank's job is to protect the infantry from other tanks. So it works well. And I, I think it's been made very clear that the Russians have not been uh, doing that very well. 
So they're losing a lot of tanks and infantry uh, armored vehicles. So just to show you a couple of pictures of the anti-tank weapons, uh, the Javelin missile actually fires in such a way that it goes up and comes down, hits the top of the tank. And the armor is thinnest on the top of the tank. So it makes for a <clears throat> very effective weapon. Um, and it's typically fired by one person, although they tell me that, that there are typically two people in the, in the Javelin team. Um, and then the N-Law is uh, <clears throat> Law's light anti-tank weapon. I think the N stands for new. Um, it's a fire and forget lightweight shoulder fired weapon. So again, one person can fire that at a tank and then disappear and the <clears throat> uh, projectile will track its way to the tank that it was aimed at. Um, <clears throat> drones have been uh, a big deal, which again, I don't know that there's been a lot of talk about that. It appears that the Ukrainians are making very good use of drones and the Russians are not. So drones can basically be used for several things. Uh, they can use, be used for targeting. So a drone which is flying over the enemy positions uh, can point out exactly where the uh, enemy weapons are. Um, they can also be used for ambushes since uh, it's, it's typically hard to detect a drone. And they can also be used for avoiding ambushes um, if you think about that. <clears throat> if you've got a uh, drone out there that's looking over the, the area, then uh, <clears throat> you, can, you can keep from being ambushed. Um, and some of them are capable of dropping munitions. And there's a, a kamikaze drone that the Ukrainians are being supplied with, which actually flies into uh, its target and explodes. So again, you know, the main point is that the Ukrainians are doing this. They actually have a special Ukrainian unit that builds some, builds some of its own drones. And they're, they're using them very effectively and it appears that the Russians are not. So, I mean, there's other weapons out there. Artillery typically, uh, you know, is fired from a distance in many cases, 20 or 25 miles away. And then you also have combat engineers who are, for instance, if you come to a river where the bridges have been blown, they can build fairly quickly a, a bridge that'll allow troops to move across. Um, <clears throat> the Russian force, Russian forces are heavily conscripts or draftees. Um, they have a one-year obligation. This is, this is not a, a great thing because tip, Typically, people are, are being drafted who don't want to be in the Russian army, and their goal is to finish their year and get out. So you don't, it's, it's just not a great way to put together forces. Um, <clears throat> Russians also, kind of like uh, what Herb was talking about, have typically considered Ukrainians to be their brothers or their cousins, uh, not an enemy force. <clears throat> and there are substantial number of Ukrainians who speak Russian and people have gone, you know, back and forth between the countries and have, you know, there's a lot of Russians do have relatives in Ukraine. Uh, <clears throat> the Russian troops are really ill-equipped in many cases. And I don't know exactly what the reason for that is other than, you know, you can certainly point to corruption where people are siphoning off the money that should have gone to equip their forces. Um, but just, you know, from what you read in the uh, <clears throat> papers and so on, they, they, they appear not to have very much equipment. The total Russian forces are about 900,000 active military, 2 million reservists on top of that. But the Russian forces in the Ukraine area are something on, on the order of about 200,000. If we talk about the Ukrainian force, Ukraine counts, uh, this, this is out of the Times <clears throat> from London, Ukraine counts 215,000 military personnel and almost a million reservists, as well as a further 200,000 emigrants, mostly men who returned home at the beginning of the conflict and 20,000 foreign volunteers. So while you know, it may sound as if the Russians greatly outnumber the Ukrainians, uh, given the 200,000 forces that the Russians have committed so far, um, and given the fact that the Ukrainians are defending, they actually have a significant advantage in manpower. All of the Ukrainian reservists have been activated. <clears throat> Obviously, not too many of the Russians have been. Uh, the Ukraine military is relatively modern. This goes back to the 2014 annexation of Crimea by the Russians. At that point, uh, Ukraine started turning to the West 
and they spent a lot of time and money to build up their military, and it is relatively modern. And obviously, the Ukraine personnel are motivated. I mean, they're defending their own country. They're defending their families. They're, uh, you know, can, at this point, I think virtually all of the Ukrainians consider the Russians to be just horrible people. Um, so they're motivated to stay in there. Logistics. This is this is something that people just typically don't recognize. And in fact, many military leaders in the past have not recognized the importance of logistics. So forces need food, water, ammunition, fuel, replacement parts, and more. I mean, you typically in an army, there's more people doing support than there are people actually out there fighting because of the fact that you need all these things. And of course, the Russian supply lines are very short. They're not going very far from the border, but they've clearly had significant problems in trying to resupply their troops. And again, I suspect a lot of that has to do with corruption with the money having been siphoned off from the military. Um, it also appears that Russian medical care is in short supply. I've heard stories and read stories about uh, wounded Russians who are just left behind um, without, without anybody trying to take care of them. Um, and clearly they've demonstrated very poor travel discipline of their resupply vehicles. Um, you, you think about those pictures you saw of that, that convoy that was on the highway. And it's one of the things you always try to do is keep people somewhat spread out so that one bomb doesn't take out a whole bunch of people. And if you remember those pictures, they were all kind of clustered up together. And of course, all you have to do is ambush the first few vehicles in the convoy. And, uh, you know, you can, you can shut the whole convoy down. And of course the, the ground around the roads was not, not that frozen the tanks got stuck in the mud. Um, so as far as the Russian tactics go, it appears the initial attempt was to take Kiev and install a puppet government. I've read stories that some of the Russian troops were told to take their dress uniforms along um, because they planned to take Kiev, install a puppet government, have a big parade. Um, it, it appears that both the armor and the infantry are stalled. Um, they have not been able to move into Kiev uh, they really haven't been able to take any of the major cities in terms of directly moving in and defeating the Ukrainians. And of course, what they've done is shifted their tactics to attacking urban areas with artillery and missiles. And this is a, follows a pattern in Chechnya and Syria where they did exactly the same thing. If they can't defeat them militarily, they just bomb the heck out of them. And of course, we know that intentionally targeting civilians is a war crime. Um, <clears throat> one thing that that Again, they don't talk too much about, it, but artillery and missiles are typically very accurate. So if targets are being hit, that means somebody is intentionally firing at them. It's not as if they're firing at a military unit and hitting an apartment building. If they're hitting an apartment building, there's a good chance they're trying to hit that apartment building. If they're hitting a hospital, there's a good chance they're trying to hit that hospital. So, uh, you know, again, that's not something that you, you typically hear too much about. Um, I want to talk about air defense artillery a little bit leading into what Terry's going to talk about. Um, <clears throat> so there are a lot of anti-aircraft weapons, mostly missiles today. There are heavy long-range systems that are fixed or semi-mobile, so something like a Patriot or an S-300. And the range on those can be, you know, on the order of 150 kilometers. So they don't have to be close to where the aircraft that they're trying to bring down are. There are also medium range vehicle mounted systems that can fire on the move. The UK has the Rapier, which has a range of about 15 kilometers. The Russians have the 2K12 Cub with a range of about 75 kilometers. So you can see that air defense artillery can reach out uh, quite a distance. And the US Army has a, a whole branch called air defense artillery. And then of course, the short, there are short range man portable air defense systems. Uh, the Stinger, which you undoubtedly heard about has a range of about a little less than five kilometers. And that's again, is a weapon that can be uh, handled by a single soldier and fired at uh, what, what are relatively close ranges at aircraft. So I'm gonna turn this over to Terry uh, to talk about the next two slides. 
So we thought you might be interested in some specific information about what a no-fly zone is and how you would establish a no-fly zone within a combat uh, perimeter. <clears throat> because it's so talked about on the news and we've heard President Zelensky, I think every parliament he's spoken to, he's demanded a no-fly zone, as have many of his deputies and parliamentarians who have traveled to other capitals. So when President Zelensky is asking us to establish a no-fly zone, what he's really asking us to do is to engage Russian ground and air forces directly, because there's no other way to establish a no-fly zone than to eliminate the enemy, first to eliminate the enemy's capability uh, to um, pursue combat goals within the air. And so what that means is uh, in this instance, um, all of the tactical ground air defense systems that Gwen's just talked about that are available to the Russians and already in Ukraine uh, would need to be taken out. Um, you might remember from the what we call the televised war, the uh, <clears throat> uh, Operation Desert Storm, um, that the first three days the U.S. Um, Air Force was primarily uh, involved in combat and leading before ground troops in order to take out all of the air defense systems available to S Saddam Hussein um, before um, we brought in heavy armor tanks and troops. And so the same thing would happen here, only not only would ground systems that are tactical and supported by Russia within Ukraine need to be taken out, um, but you'd need to go at least 100 miles into uh, Eastern Russia to take out all of their air defense systems. And then still um, targets in the Ukraine, both on the air, in the air and on the ground would be um, endangered by Russian missile systems and long range artillery. So um, it's a real political issue. I'm not saying that we shouldn't establish a fly zone as we get, as we see more and more of um, the horrors of the Russian army has uh, placed on the Ukrainian people, uh, certainly there's gonna be more and more pressure for us um, to actively become actively involved in this combat. And I wouldn't rule out that we do become actively involved. You may remember from high school history that it took us what, three years to, to enter World War I, uh, two years maybe on World War II, and so we're in the same position right now that our parents were as they watched um, in World War I and World War II, the destruction of Europe. And finally, um, for both political and humane reasons, we entered into both of those combat situations. But we should remember the decision to uh, establish uh, a no-fly zone demands that we'd establish air superiority, and that means direct combat uh, with Russian air and ground forces by the United States Air Force. <clears throat> so uh, should we make that political decision, <clears throat> what would it take to establish air superiority? Um, well, first you've got to consider the geography. You, the Ukraine uh, has 263,000 square miles. It's the largest country in Europe. And uh, from east to west, it is 800 miles long. From north to south, approximately 300 miles. So you have a huge area that you would need to uh, protect and consider that airspace is three-dimensional. Uh, I guess you could multiply that by three or four. Um, so what it, what it would take would be to deploy at least two Air Force wings into Poland I'm not familiar with um, Polish Air Force assets, but I would assume there are, there are um, military um, bases with long enough runways, you'd need at least 6,000 feet and the, the maintenance capability to support them um, within central Poland. A wing uh, of uh, fighter bombers usually includes three squadrons. Each squadron has 18 to 24 operational aircraft within the squadron. So I think you'd need at the minimum two wings deployed, plus the maintenance capability 
um, which would be about 300 people for each wing. Uh, and of course, um, millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of equipment necessary to maintain uh, the, the fighter bombers. Then they would need to establish a 24 hour combat air patrol <clears throat> over Ukraine. I would think there would have to be one in Northeastern uh, Ukraine, uh, probably uh, North Central Ukraine, Ukraine is where the actual orbit would be. But here we're concerned with <clears throat> Russian air and air defense forces <clears throat> entering from Belarus in the north. Then you'd have to establish one in the east, um, probably close to the Donetsk region and, um, and keep 24 hour combat air patrol uh, there. Uh, so that would mean you've got at least a flight of three fighter bombers in each cap combat air patrol orbit tw up 24 hours a day. That would require massive refueling sorties. And so you'd have to bring an entire air refueling wing into Poland to support that. And of course, you would put <clears throat> those unarmed aircraft, the air refueling airplane, um, in danger of being shot down by Russian planes or Russian air defense systems if we didn't have total air superiority. You'd then ha have to have a 24 hour cap of at least three fighter bombers uh, with probably F-22s in this case in Eastern Ukraine or Northeastern. And to support those two combat air patrol 24 hours, you'd probably need six NATO airborne warning and control aircraft. That's a 737 mounted with a radar on top and um, a number of classified surveillance systems within a crew of about 24 or 25. And in there would be a mission commander um, responsible for the on-scene air command and control uh, of, of those caps and of any refueling and of any combat that would be entered into. That's the job I performed in Desert Storm coming in from Turkey to Northern Ukraine. So I'm well aware of, of what that takes. <clears throat> um, NATO AWACS is, is uh, home-based in Geilenkirchen, Germany, which is in Northern Germany, right on the uh, border with the Netherlands. And so that's a 600 mile, about six, six to 800 miles from uh, Eastern, excuse me, Western Ukraine. Um, so you need to deploy those NATO AWACS airplanes uh, into Poland. Uh, and I would say fairly close to the Ukrainian border. NATO owns only 11 of those airplanes. So you would really, in order to keep six operational um, and set up a 22, 24 hour orbits, you would need probably the entire fleet of 11 NATO airplanes designated to support those uh, surveillance orbits. <clears throat> Um, the AWACS airplane can stay up about 18 to 21 hours at a time. The normal mission is about 12 hours, um, but usually you're going to have um, maintenance problems that might limit a takeoff uh, to replace one airplane with another. And so you can go longer than 12 hours, and that's going to require uh, one to three air refuelings to keep those airplanes up. So, um, and you've got to have a full maintenance capability deployed into uh, Poland to support that. It's going to be a, a would be a huge job, uh, and, and of course, hugely expensive. <clears throat> when I, I, maybe some questions will address this later, but um, there was an interesting article that um, most of us read in the last week, and um, that showed how much. Uh, the United States supports NATO and how little, especially some of the new NATO nations do. And the point was that they were asking us to fight the war for them when they were not putting their forces or many of them have no forces um, up in especially the Balkans. Um, but the issue, of course, is in that while that is expensive and the U.S. does bear the brunt of uh, supporting NATO resources, uh, you can see how much money we spend to go to war. Uh, and, and so the idea that a, a country in NATO probably is not going to be attacked due to NATO Article 5, which says an attack on one is an attack on all, 
in the long run really saves us money and preserves the post-World War II uh, world um, political um, system. So um, that's what I wanted to talk about it, to introduce the no-fly zone and the issues there. And next slide, Gwen, would be on nuclear weapons. That's certainly an issue because it's pretty clear that the reason the US does not want to get involved directly in combat with Russian forces is the threat of nuclear weapons being used in, uh, by Russia. And <clears throat> Putin made a, a splash before his forces uh, invaded Ukraine by, by having a nuclear exercise telling the world his nuclear forces had been put on alert. Uh, I can tell you there was probably no change in the force structure when he said that, because by their very nature, nuclear forces are always on alert, both in Russia and the United States and in NATO. But nuclear weapons are not all the same. We're not always talking about high megaton bombs that may be used to destroy an entire city um, as we did in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in order to end the war of World War II. Largest weapons, of course, can destroy you know, a city that, that uh, or an area that could be as large as 100 square miles uh, with one war here. And they're delivered by intercontinental ballistic missiles. The US has stationed those missiles throughout the United States. We're probably pretty familiar with uh, sites up in Montana and Wyoming, um, the northern uh, tier of the United States where we have had ICBMs on alert with nuclear weapons for years. Um, there's also such a thing as tactical nuclear weapons. Now they're much smaller and, and um, they're used uh, on airplanes, uh, interceptor airplanes, as well as on uh, army artillery uh, and uh, short range uh, surface to air and surface to surface missiles. Um, these are typically battlefield weapons. Uh, they, and again, it can be delivered by both aircraft and artillery. To give you an example, we have had, um, we had um, air defense interceptors on alert throughout the periphery of the United States in the 1950s, throughout the 1960s and 70s that were nuclear equipped. Uh, these uh, F-106s, F-104s, F-105s, I think at some point uh, carried Air 2As, uh, which was a nuclear equipped air-to-air -air missile. And uh, the reason you would even consider a tactical nuclear weapon on an airplane is that your PK uh, necessary for a kill goes down. PK is percentage of kill. So if you're firing a rocket, your percentage of kill is very low because rockets trajectory, um, they're not smart weapons, they go anywhere. If you have an IR radar missile, your percentage of kill goes up and is higher. But if you have a radar tactical uh, nuclear uh, missile like the Air 2A on board an interceptor, then you don't even have to hit the airplane, the bomber, assumingly you're trying to shoot down, you just need to blow up a nuclear weapon near it. So they're very effective. So we know that the Russians have all of these capabilities to some degree. Um, the, rep the Russian Air Force is known to have some 6,533 nuclear weapons. Um, I would say the bulk of those are tactical. The US has something like 6,300, so we're pretty similar. Um, but as the slide shows, using nuclear weapons, e e either one, brings up a lot of poor choices for response. And so again, we get into a political issue when we talk about helping Ukraine. You know, do we believe um, that Putin would use either tactical or strategic nuclear weapons either against Ukraine or against NATO or um, in worst case, ICBMs to the United States? Um, it seems, uh, I've seen a lot of people say lately that's ridiculous, the fact of, that we entered Ukraine and tried to set up air superiority uh, and uh, a new no-fly zone would not endanger Mother Russia. So there would be, we have a nuclear deterrent, you know, that is uh, assured destruction, mutual assured destruction, 
and no reasonable person uh, or leader would um, open up that can of worms of, uh, of mutual assured destruction. The issue, of course, is that Putin, his ego, can he afford defeat? Um, most people believe that a defeat for the Russian army in Ukraine would lead to, if not very quickly, certainly within a year or two, um, Putin being uh, moved out of his position of power. Uh, and most dictators, once they are out of power, end at the end of a rope. So in order just to protect his own uh, life and power, he might use certainly some type of nuclear weapon. So um, those are issues that need to be considered by our political leadership, and they are. And at some point, um, as we did in both World War I and World War II, and we're becoming closer to it, um, there's pressure for us to enter a conflict and make decisions about whether nuclear weapons might be used by the enemy. Thank you. Okay, that, that's the end of our presentation. Um, so we'd like to open it up to audience questions. Um, either Kathy or Karen, can you bring up whatever questions we've had in the chat so far? Okay. Karen, do you want to start? Yeah, uh, Barb made the first comment on the chat, and she said it's interesting there would be nostalgia for sociopathic leaders, not unlike the perception and support of autocratic leadership within the Republican Party now in the US. Not really a question, but a good observation. <laughs> so, and then Carol, I'll just ask the first question. Carol said, what's the current political leadership of Georgia? Is it Western leaning or more like Viktor Orban's Hungarian administration? And Herb answered that. He said, that's a good question. They say they're Western leaning and have continued to ask for EU membership, but they're also trying to maintain good relationships with Russia. Many Georgians think the government includes pro-Russian element. You wanna to add to that? Uh, no, I, th I think my re response kind of sums it up. All right. Uh, and the next question is, um, are the Russians using Uranian dipped or, or tip weapons at this point, which apparently we did maybe in Afghanistan? So the, the primary round that you fire from a tank at another tank is a, is a depleted uranium round, meaning it's not radioactive, <clears throat> but it's an isotope of uranium, which is very, very heavy. And so that, that round is a kinetic energy round, meaning there's no explosive. You just fire it at a very high muzzle velocity and it tends to penetrate the armor. So um, I don't. I would. I would guess that the Russian tanks use a similar type of ammunition. Thank you. Then Barbara uh, Bev. I'm sorry, Bev. I called you Barbara because it just says B Ellis. Okay. <laughs> Bev Ellis says, "What's your military and NATO perspective on giving Ukraine air support, planes, not personnel?" And I, I think. Terrence talked a little bit about that. Um, I really do not understand why our government hasn't taken up the Polish um, offer to send their MiG-29s to Ukraine to be replaced by Air Force F-16s, which we're taking out of the inventory now. Um, the, the Ukrainians have a MiG-29 force of their own, I, I don't know how many are left or how, even how many they started with. I think in the first couple of weeks of the year uh, of the war, we, uh, the, the numbers that were being floated were something like they had 65 airplanes uh, in the Ukrainian Air Force. And that would include, I'm sure, helicopters, of which were the bulk of that 65. But they, the point is they do have uh, combat qualified pilots trained to fly the MiG-29 which the other Eastern European nations also have based on their, their time in the Soviet Union. The 29 is a very effective airplane. Um, and um, the, so it seems to me that uh, I, I just don't understand what, uh, why our government believes that um, 
that would would increase um, the conflict into a more dangerous um, situation by providing that air power to um, the Ukrainians. They could certainly be moved into Poland and the um, Ukrainian pilots could come across the border and bring those airplanes back so there wouldn't be any direct U.S. Environment, involvement. In fact, our only involvement would be to replace the 29s with F-16s, and I think that would be part of foreign military sales. I don't think the Poles are suggesting we give it to them free, but they may be. Um, but we are now taking the F-16 out of our inventory and instead of sending them down to the boneyard uh, in uh, Tucson, Arizona, we could send them to Eastern European countries. There's more than just Poland who might then send their, M20, their uh, MiG-29s to Ukraine. The one, the one explanation that I've heard about that, which doesn't make a tremendous amount of sense to me, but they've, they, the, I've heard the White House say that they want to not send any offensive weapons into Ukraine. I'm not sure there's such a thing as a totally defensive weapon. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm, I guess, you know, again, they're trying to walk this fine line about not getting NATO and Russia you know, involved. If, if the Ukrainians were to use those MiGs to actually attack targets in Russia, which would, for them militarily would be a good thing to do, that might cause some problems. But it's, you know, it's, it's a tricky sort of thing. And Again, it feels up, like we're being blackmailed by Putin, doesn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I've heard it called nuclear blackmail. Um, another question is, has from Carol Cure, has Ukraine received any of the air defense missiles yet, the S-300 surface-to-air missiles that were going to come from maybe Slovakia? I know they were, I know they were planning to send the S-300s. I don't know if they've received them. Do you know any more about that, Terry? Yes, I, I uh, listened to, um, I can't think of his name, but he's a two-star retired Navy Admiral that is the uh, Pentagon uh, press PR guy now. And he said that 300s had been had been sent oh, as long as two weeks ago. So I would assume that they have been received in Ukraine um, by the uh, Ukrainian Air Force and are probably in operational capability by now. OK, okay. Uh, next question is Moscow is very close to the Ukraine border, 490 kil kilometers. Can we give Ukraine longer range missiles like the NATO Stone Road launcher, which has a longer range to intimidate Putin since we can't send aircraft? I think you get back to the exact same situation that we were talking about before that, you know, that's, is, is that in fact going to cause Russia to do something crazy like you know, use a nuclear weapon. And, I, you know, there's no good answer to, if they use a tactical nuke, what do we do? Do we respond with a tactical nuke? <clears throat> Where does that go? That doesn't sound good. So I, I think, again, there would be some real political issues around giving Ukraine anything that could strike Moscow. <clears throat> but I don't know. What do you think, Terry? Well, I would say that um, uh, even as far back as uh, when o an old man like me was on active duty, <laughs> Uh, the Russian uh, order of battle includes first use of nuclear weapons. Um, and so that uh, fact might be even a stronger impetus uh, to our government to consider very carefully uh, any type of offensive capability that we would provide to Ukraine. Um, and, and as you know, right now, um, Russia is using cluster bombs, which are uh, humanitarian uh, war, um, what am I trying to say, Gwen? Um, uh, fall under they, war crimes. War crimes. <clears throat> They're using cluster bombs, and they said they've also are using these new hypersonic missiles. So um, it's not a big step for them to go to nuclear weapons should they feel that is necessary. And I can see that were we to place an offensive surface to surface or missile system, into Ukraine that could reach Moscow, they would consider that uh, just as we considered um, nuclear weapons systems, missiles being put in Cuba in, when was that, 1963, 62? Yeah. Um, 
the question was asked is, uh, could someone discuss the uh, promise to support and defend Ukraine when they gave up their nuclear uh, systems? So I, I know a very little bit about that. I'll say what I know, and then maybe the Herb or Terry can kick in. But basically, a large percentage of the Soviet Union's nuclear missiles were in Ukraine. And so there was a diplomatic effort when the Soviet Union broke up to get Ukraine to give up those missiles so that you didn't have you know, Russia and the U.S. and Ukraine and other countries. And they did, in fact, give them up. I don't know exactly what promises were made to them. I can tell you that U.S. was not signatory to that agreement. Um, I'm trying to think, remember the name of it. It's not the Oslo Agreement, but it's named after one of uh, the, uh, I think, a town in Poland where they met. So the, the, the principal uh, um, nation that was to uh, agree to secure and protect and defend Ukraine were they to give up their nuclear weapons, which they did, was, the, was Russia. So... Uh, that promise has already been broken. Wow. Karen? Okay, uh, the next one, uh, Bev asks, what about the attack on Chernobyl um, shuttered nuclear plant? The Russians left, but article uh, about them trenching in contaminated areas. So now the soldiers are seeking treatment in Belarus for radiation poisoning. <laughs> Attacking and taking over nuclear plants is new territory in warfare. Could you opine on this? So I, interestingly enough, I was given a book about Chernobyl for Christmas this last year and you know, read through that. And, and what happened in Chernobyl is one of the <clears throat> reactors there uh, went critical and basically blew up. And they had to take literally years to try to get <clears throat> that covered up. Meanwhile, there was radiation spread around Chernobyl, um, and there was radiation that was carried you know, through the atmosphere all the way into Europe. <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> excuse me, um, they, they finally covered it up, but they put a, a no habitation zone around that area because there had been radiation at fairly high levels spread around the plant. And I have no idea what the Russians were thinking about <clears throat> in taking control of that because the other reactors are shut down. It's not producing any power. Um, there is no military target value there that I could possibly see. And it's, it's another one of those sort of irrational things that the Russians have been doing as part of this attack. So <clears throat> who knows what they were thinking. Gwen, if I can just add, when the Russians took over that current operating nuclear facility uh, in Ukraine and held it for a couple of weeks uh, and they fired on it. As you may recall, there were pictures on TV of them firing on that. Um, after they left, uh, the Ukrainian um, workers uh, who, who keep that, that nuclear power plant online said that they found out the Russians didn't even know what they were attacking when they attacked it. They were so poorly prepared, they had no idea um, that they were attacking an operating nuclear plant. Wow. Uh, all, you need, all you need to do is get rid of the cooling systems and we're done. <laughs> so it's, we're lucky. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, let's see, I think the next question is, um, I assume it's about their uh, Air Force, but the question is how old is the Polish fleet? Are they taught, I don't know if they're, referring to the MiGs that uh, were perhaps promised uh, in return for our F-16s. Um, I, I believe it's about the aircraft in Poland. I don't know what their helicopter force consists of. And, you know, it appears that um, they did use two uh, attack uh, helicopters to take out uh, a fuel storage facility about 40 miles inside Russia. Um, so I don't know how new or old those are or who provided them. I would assume like the rest of the Air Force, those are Russian airplanes. Um, and the, the MiG-29 um, is a 1970s technology. Uh, it's a great airplane. Um, I flew against the MiG-21. We, we had uh, F-4 Phantoms in, in Vietnam and uh, while our 
while we had a, a five to one success rate there, it was mostly due to our training. That MiG-21 was a wonderful airplane. So the MiG-29 is a um, 70s technology built in the 80s, uh, made operational late 80s, early 90s, uh, and um, is still a very effective airplane. Um, it does require, unlike modern fighter systems, of which I've unfortunately never been able to fly, it requires um, the pilot uh, to attain targets with a fire control system, and the only information they have comes to them through their own fire control system, their own radar or IR, that, whereas our fighter systems nowadays receive tactical and strategic information from ground and air-based and even man intel all at once. It's a fusion uh, system. So they're much more capable uh, of defending themselves and of assessing uh, the uh, air battle uh, situation uh, in an up-to-date time. But the 29 is a very effective airplane. The problem would be parts and maintenance. Thank you. Okay, the next one. Uh... Pat says, what about our humanitarian assistance? For example, military militia organizing training in Ukraine over the last eight years, it obviously worked rather well. Yeah, as we mentioned earlier, after the 2014 annexation of Crimea, um, the Ukrainians started upgrading their military. And since they were turning West, I think it was probably NATO that was supplying them with assistance in terms of training. Um, <clears throat> And as, as Terry was saying about aircraft, you know, if you've got a better trained pilot, e even in, you know, comparable aircraft, that, that better trained force will do much better. And it's the same thing on the ground. Um, it's, it's, been, <laughs> it's been astounding to me how incompetent <clears throat> the Russian forces have been. Um, I mean, you, you look at everything they're doing and, you know, from the top generals on down, you go, what the heck are they doing? Why, what are they thinking? Apparently, they're very poorly trained. And so, you know, the fact that we were able to give assistance in training the Ukrainian forces, I think, has been a big factor in terms of how well they've been able to hold off the Russians. Wow. Uh, Carol Kier said that she thinks that memorandum you're referring to is called the Budapest memorandum, and apparently Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine gave up their nuclear weapons as a result of the Budapest memorandum that prohibited the Russian Federation, the UK, or the US from threatening or using military force or economic coercion, except in self-defense. Anybody want to comment on that? There's a certain amount of danger in trusting the Russians, particularly somebody <laughs> like Putin. Indeed. Karen? No, I have nothing to add to that. I, th I th appreciate that added information. Um, I don't believe we were signatory to it, even though it mentioned us, but um, I'm not sure. Mm. Our last comment uh, by Barbara is about propaganda. She says uh, she talks to 10 Russian citizens each day through uh, an activist site and 100% of them support Putin. And they, they say Zelensky is bombing children in the Donbass. Oh. Uh, Putin's propaganda is extremely successful. And I'll, I'll add to that that, what is it yesterday that uh, Fox News said that it, it could be a false flag. You know, I mean, like the Ukrainians are placing bodies. So it's getting in, insane. I was just going to add, um, <laughs> since, since my part was a little bit or seemingly uh, not, not as relevant, but I would say that in, in listening and watching the news about how the Russian military has performed um, since the invasion and the reports of um, corruption and uh, weakness in the command structure, it struck me that Putin really has just sort of continued this Soviet operation and all its negative elements um, from the time he took power. Another uh, comment is made that uh, it's amazing how many field flag officers have been identified and killed on the ground by the Ukrainian militia. 
that's an interesting thing that's happened. And I think there's a couple of factors there. When, when we were training, you know, when I first came in, it was Vietnam era, and we were talking about fighting in the jungle. And then we went back to defending Europe. And one of the things that you always try to do is to take out the Soviet leadership because they, their dogma doesn't really tell the junior officers down the line what they're trying to do. You give them an order, but you don't really provide context and so on. So if, if you can kill the leader at the top, it's sort of their operations tend to fall apart. I can tell you in any military operation, a lot of things go wrong. <clears throat> and so, you know, if, if you don't have, uh, if you can take out those uh, top officers, it, it really hurts their ability to move. And apparently the Russians have it structured much the same way. And you used to talk about, you know, take out the tank with all the antennas on it, because that was the leader's tank. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, you know, at some point, if things are, are getting stopped up, <clears throat> that general may in fact have to go to the front to try to straighten things out. And that puts him in a position where he can in fact be <clears throat> uh, a casualty. I'd add also, Gwen, that um, the, the Russian military has never developed a professional non-commissioned officer force. Um, that's, you know, Sarge, who's been there before, who may be 20 years older and experienced than the junior officer, uh, and who's primarily really responsible for training and discipline uh, in the force. And they just don't have that. Um, they're very much a top-down force. And my guess is that um, and the, the junior officers have absolutely no initiative at all. They're punished for initiative, essentially. So I think that general officers and, and battalion commanders who are colonels uh, have had to place themselves uh, in danger move forward to get the Russian forces to take any initiative uh, once they were met with um, force that they didn't expect from the Ukraines. Yep. What else do we have, Karen? Well, there's one more. Um, Paulette asked, short of going directly into the war, is there any way we can help the Ukrainians wherever they are right now? We take we are going to take 100,000 refugees in a year, which is not much, nothing compared to what they're taking in Europe. Yeah, the, the refugee thing is always an issue. I don't, I don't know if Herb wants to say anything about that, but you know, the, there's, as a refugee, you know, typically you're thinking, I wanna, get, I wanna go back home. I want this to be over and I wanna go back home. So if they end up in the US, they're a long ways from home. And, um, you know, that it's, it's a problem. I, I certainly, you know, I, the, the one thing I think that all of us can do is support some of the uh, organizations like the International Rescue Committee who are really putting resources into trying to help the refugees and as much as possible, the civilians in Ukraine. Um, <clears throat> so obviously, you know, the more money they have, the more things they can do. Um, <clears throat> it's, you know, this whole thing has been kind of crazy in the sense that what we thought was going to happen in the beginning didn't happen. And then what we thought would happen next didn't happen and so on down the line. So, I, I, you know, it's, it's really hard to tell what's going to happen next. You know, are the Russians going to take Eastern Ukraine with the intention of then using that as a base to try to take the rest of Ukraine? I don't know. Herb, did you have any comments on that? No, I'd agree with all of that. I mean, it, bringing them all the way over to the United States when it's pretty unclear what's going to happen in the war, when they they're not economic refugees like many of our refugees, and they just want to get back home. Seems like you're may maybe making things more complicated. Along the same line, I heard on the on one of the news uh, programs this morning that there are some Ukrainians who have escaped that are going back into, I think it was Lviv, I'm not sure, from Poland. So I thought that was interesting that they're already making moves to try to go back home. Yep. even though this conflict is far from over. So I think we've run out of questions. Um, I don't, I'm not sure. I, I know if Paulette Church is still on, she was going to make a, an announcement about something that's happening, I think, later this evening. Are you still there, Paulette? Yes, I am. Oh, thank you. Um, the Rotary Club of Durango is uh, has a speaker uh, this evening who is local here from Ukraine who 
uh, was interviewed by CNN and will be again. He will be, uh, the program he's giving tonight will be live streamed on Facebook. And so if you go to your Facebook page and you go to your lookup, it's Rotary Club of Durango. And when you get there, there's either going to be a button showing that says videos or one that shows more and leads to video. And if you click on that, our program, our, our meeting starts at 6. The program should start about 6.30. I'd go in a little earlier. Uh, you won't be able to answer, ask questions like you can here, uh, but you'll be able to see the program. If you don't have time tonight, it will be there. It will be saved on that location. It will be there. Okay. Thank you, Paula. That sounds like that would be very interesting. I do see uh, something in the chat from Kathleen Adams. She just wanted us to announce that Jenna Griswold is coming to Durango on April the 14th. Uh, she'll be, I think, at Kathleen Adams' house from 5.30 to 7. Uh, so, you know, if you, uh, if you can make that, uh, that's, <laughs> she's running against somebody who's just totally crazy. <clears throat> so we've got to make sure that we're supporting Jenna. And uh, Karen mentioned that if you volunteered at caucus to be a delegate to the CD3 assembly, it's tonight at 6 p.m. So check your email. Anything else? Any other announcements? Okay, let's give a virtual round of applause to our speakers and thank them for participating. Um, and we will thank all of you for attending and we'll have some information on our May luncheon soon. So everybody have a great day and we'll see you hopefully in May. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Excellent program. Very much. It was very good. Terrific program. Yeah, really.